In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Gospel passage this morning, our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, told us that when we fast, we ought not to be like the hypocrites who disfigure their faces and give expressions to say, Oh, I'm fasting. Look how holy I am. Jesus Christ tells us they have the reward. Rather, he tells us that when we fast, we ought to do it secretly, washing our face, anointing our hair with oil, going about our daily business so that no one will know that we are fasting, only our God in heaven who sees in secret and will reward us. He closes the gospel by telling us to not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. Rather, he tells us, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, nor do thieves break in and steal. So what are these treasures that he is talking about? What are items that we can take with us when we die? Perhaps you've heard me say this before, a joke that was told to me by a funeral home director. He has not seen a lot of U-Haul trailers attached to hearses bringing the casket to the cemetery. In other words, all of the things that we have on this earth, they're going to stay here. They're not coming with us. Our house is not coming with us. Our car is not coming with us. Our jewelry is not coming with us. And neither is our reputation coming with us. So what can we bring to heaven? What treasures can we acquire that will not be destroyed, that cannot be stolen by outside forces? These treasures are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Kindness, generosity, patience, love, long-suffering and forbearance. These are things that cannot be taken away from you. These are the treasures that will go on past this life and define us in the next life. There is only one way to lose these treasures. There is only one way for these treasures to be destroyed, and it is by our own hands. And how do we do that? How do we destroy these virtues, these treasures? The key, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, is the theme of today, Forgiveness Sunday. For the Lord begins his gospel passage today by saying, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you you. But if you do not forgive your brothers and sisters their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. In other words, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, even if we do all manner of good works, even if we fast perfectly for great Lent, even if we donate a million dollars in almsgiving during Great Lent, even if we attend every single Lenten service, if we do not forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ and ask in turn for them to forgive us, it's empty, meaningless. It has no benefit because we have robbed ourselves of that benefit. It is for this reason that Mother Church places this Sunday, the Sunday of forgiveness, as a moment in time 
before we begin our first steps of great and holy Lent, as we walk towards the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are called to forgive one another. We are called on this day to call up our friends, our relatives, or even our enemies, and ask them to forgive us. It does not matter what their answer is. What matters is that you forgive them. The great saint, John of the Ladder, says when contemplating the remembrance of wrongs, which is tied to anger at our brothers and sisters, tells us that we have not rid ourselves of remembering wrongs, of anger towards our brothers and sisters in Christ until that day when something befalls that enemy, something bad, and then we weep out of genuine loss and sadness for that person. We have a tendency in our cultures to say, well, I forgive, but I'll never forget. We have to let go of the animosity in our heart. We have to let go of those sickle hooks that are gripping our heart, that are not allowing us to move forward in our spiritual life or in life in general, because the remembrance of wrongs, the lack of forgiveness, is cancerous to our soul, to our mind, and even to our body. So my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, I beg of you on this Sunday of forgiveness, reach out to those who you feel you have wronged and ask for their forgiveness. As your priest, I'm sure that there are ways that I've let you down or hurt you in ways that I may not be aware. And so on this day, I ask your forgiveness for my failings as your parish priest. At the direction of the Metropolitan, we will be reading the encyclical of Patriarch Bartholomew. By God's mercy, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, an ecumenical patriarch to the plentitude of the Church, may the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, together with our prayer, blessing, and forgiveness, be with you all. Most honorable brothers and blessed children in the Lord, with the goodwill and grace of God, the giver of all good things, we are entering holy and great Lent, the arena of ascetic struggles. The Church knows the labyrinths of the human soul and the thread of the Ariadne, the way out of all impasse, humility, repentance, the power of prayer, and the sacred services of contrition, fasting that eliminates the passions, patience, obedience to the rule of piety. And so the Church invites us once again this year to a divinely inspired journey whose measure is the cross and whose horizon is the resurrection of Christ. The veneration of the cross in the middle of Holy and Great Lent reveals the meaning of this whole period. The word of our Lord echoes strikingly, whoever desires to follow me, let them lift up their crosses each day and follow me. We are called to lift our own cross, following the Lord and beholding his life-giving cross, with the awareness that the Lord is the one that saves and not the lifting of our crosses. The cross of the Lord is the judgment of our criteria, the judgment of the world, and at the same time the promise that evil in all its forms does not have the final word in history. In looking to Christ and under his protection as the one who permits our struggle while blessing and strengthening our effort, we fight the good fight. Afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, 2 Corinthians. This is the experiential quintessence also during the present period of the cross and the resurrection. 
we are on a journey to the resurrection to the cross, through which joy has come to the whole world. Some of you may wonder why the church, in the midst of the current pandemic, would add to the already existing health restrictions yet another quarantine, namely Great Lent. Indeed, Great Lent is also a quarantine, a period that lasts 40 days. Nevertheless, the Church does not aim to weaken us further with additional obligations and prohibitions. On the contrary, it calls us to give meaning to the quarantine that we are living as a result of the coronavirus through Great Lent, as liberation from enslavement to the things of our world. Today's Gospel reading establishes the conditions of this liberation. The first condition is fasting, not in the sense of abstaining only from specific foods, but also from those habits that keep us attached to the world. Such abstinence does not comprise an expression of contempt of the world, but a necessary precondition for reorienting our relationship with the world and for experiencing the unique joy of discovering the world as the domain of Christian witness. This is why, even during this stage of fasting, the approach and experience of the life of the faithful have a paschal dimension, the taste of the resurrection. The Lenten atmosphere is not depressing, but joyous. It is the great joy that was proclaimed as good news by the angel to all people at the birth of the Savior. This is the unwavering fullness of joy of life in Christ. Christ is always present in our life. He is closer to us than we ourselves. All the days of our life, unto the end of the ages, the life of the Church is an unshakable witness to the grace that has come and to the hope of the kingdom, to the fullness of revelation of the mystery of the divine economy. Faith is the response to God's loving condescension to us. It is the yes of our whole existence to him who bowed the heavens and descended in order to redeem the human race from the slavery of the enemy, and in order to open for us the way towards deification through grace. The sacrificial love for the neighbor and the care for the whole creation spring from and are nurtured by this gift of grace. If this charitable love for others and the God-pleasing concern for creation are absent, then my neighbor becomes my hell, and creation is abandoned to irrational forces which transform it into an object of exploitation and into a hostile environment for humankind. The second condition of the liberation promised by Great Lent is forgiveness. Oblivion of divine mercy and God's ineffable beneficence, breach of the Lord's commandment that we should become the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and a false transformation of the Christian way of life, to all these attitudes leads a closed spirituality that thrives on the denial and rejection of the other and of the world, wipes out love, forgiveness, and the acceptance of the different. Yet this barren and arrogant attitude of life is denounced emphatically by the word of the gospel on the first three Sundays of the Triodion. It is known that such extremes are especially prevalent during periods of the church invites its faithful to spiritual discipline and vigilance. However, the authentic spiritual life is a way of eternal, internal renewal, an exodus from ourselves, a loving movement towards our neighbor. It is not based on syndromes of purity and exclusion, but on forgiveness and discernment, doxology and thanksgiving, according to the experiential wisdom of the ascetic tradition. It is not food, but gluttony that is evil, not speaking, but idle speech, not the world, but the passions. With this attitude and these sentiments, we join our prayers with all of you, beloved brothers and children, that we may definitively overcome the, le the lethal pandemic and swiftly respond to its social and economic consequences. And we ask your beseeching supplications too for the reopening of the sacred theological school of Halki after a long period of 50 years that has passed since its silence was imposed externally and fully unjustly as we welcome holy and great Lent in the church singing and chanting together, God is with us, to whom belongs the glory and might to the endless ages, amen. Holy and Great Lent 2021, Bartholomew of Constantinople, 
fervent supplicant for all before God. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, as his All Holiness mentioned, as we are still in the midst of the pandemic, it is our duty to try our best to combat this through prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and science. It is for this reason that we wear our masks, socially distance, and sanitize our hands. For those of St. Basil who have loved ones that are struggling to acquire an appointment for the vaccine, we ask that you call the church office that we can help you try to find an appointment for the vaccine. The more people that are vaccinated, the quicker we will come to a point of destroying and defeating this coronavirus. It is my hope and prayer that you will be able to join us this week as we begin Holy and Great Lent. Tomorrow on Clean Monday, Cathara de Terra, we will have the Mega Bodhitno, the Great Compline Service. And it is my prayer that you will be able to join us for this and the many other services of Great and Holy Lent. I pray that your journey is fruitful, that our repentance is sincere and beneficial, and that we can walk together arm in arm for the resurrection of our Lord. God bless you all and have a wonderful, wonderful day.